until my strength has faded. Standing on earth till my knees can I will lift my voice and shout a grateful song. I will sing, I will sing until my voice is gone. Please recite this week's scripture memory verse with me. It's Psalm 107 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
I do hope you are glad that you are here to worship with the body of Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is why we gather. If this is your first time here, we just welcome you. We're glad to have you as our guest this morning. Um, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. A couple ways you can do that. If uh, you're comfortable filling out your name and just giving us some contact information, we would just like to reach out and welcome you um, through an email or something of that, that nature. But also you can just go to the uh, Welcome Center if you have questions. There's information about the church, ways you can get involved. Uh, some of the things we do do here is we have different uh, groups that meet, some men's and women's Bible studies, and um, just a chance to connect with other people, and we just know that's so important. And we even talked about that in uh, Sunday school this morning. It's just so valuable to meet uh, with a, a smaller group of people and encourage one another in our walk with Jesus. And those of you that are joining us online, we are glad that you are here as well. Uh, just a few things to draw your attention to. One, we do have uh, a candle, and for those of you that have been here a while, you know what that is, but if you're new here, you might not know what that is. Uh, and it's a way that we like to just recognize someone that has made that decision to trust Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And uh, we did have the opportunity, we learned about someone in our church. They had a family member they'd been praying for and had a chance to uh, just really clearly explain the gospel and uh, pray with that individual who made that step of faith. And so, can we just give the Lord Lord, uh, a thank you for bringing someone into his kingdom. And that is uh, what we are about, is building kingdom people, and it is so exciting to see when a new person comes to that uh, decision of saving faith. Uh, the other uh, uh, item just to draw your attention to that's not in the bulletin, but next week you will be getting some more information uh, regarding it, is this summer we are going to do something starting in June called Summer Affinity Groups, and this is going to be an opportunity for you just to connect with some uh, people in the church uh, around a common interest, and maybe there's something that you would like to host. Maybe you, you have a, a group that uh, play, I know there's folks that play board games, or maybe you want to have a group that goes biking or hikes in the woods, whatever it might be, or maybe there's uh, just uh, you're a C.S. Lewis fan and you're going to discuss all things C.S. Lewis. Um, whatever that might be, we're going to have an opportunity for you to fill out uh, a form if you'd like to host a group. And there's two purposes in this. One is so that you have an opportunity to connect with other people in the church, but also an opportunity if you want to invite a friend or um, a family member or neighbor that does not go to church, and it's just a way to connect them with other people that love the Lord and just uh, be an encouragement and outreach in that way. So you'll see more information next week um, on those summer affinity groups and uh, how you can either host one and then later we'll post those that are going to be available so you can participate. With that, would you bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for each day you grant us, and this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for each person you have brought here this morning, that we can serve you, that we can worship you, Lord. And Father, as Pastor Scott comes and, and shares your word with us, we just pray that you fill him with your Holy Spirit, that the words he gives us will, will just touch each of us, Lord, where we need to be touched, so that we can be conformed and molded and shaped into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to you. Welcome to worship together. And having said that, I am going to start with something that may make a number of you fairly angry with me. Um, some of you may not care. Some of you may 
agree with me, but I think there may be a number of you who, who get upset at this, but I think it needs to be said. The Minnesota Timberwolves are a terrible basketball team. <laughs> All right, I'm, I said it. There it is. Uh, for those who may not follow, and I don't much myself, but this week the Timberwolves lost in the first round of the playoffs again. They have been a team in existence for over 30 years. And do you know how many times they've gotten past the first round of the playoffs? One. One. They, they went relatively far that year, but didn't even get to the finals, even having some success. They are a really terrible team. I mean, sorry. No, I grew up in an era with Michael Jordan, right? Michael Jordan went, he won six championships by himself. We can't get past the first round as a whole franchise. Now, those of you with more basketball knowledge and experience than me, you could argue why we did or did not have success this year or any other year, who, uh, who was or was not to blame, any, any number of things. And, and I'll be very honest with you, I just said it for the reaction. I don't care. Um, but it is a reaction, right? I, you, you laughed, you, you maybe had that moment of, no, we're, we're better than you think we are. Sports fans love to debate the question of who is the greatest, right? Whether it's your basketball team, your football team, your baseball team, who is the best and why? Is it Michael Jordan? Is it LeBron James? Is it Tom Brady? Is it Peyton Manning? Is it Pele? Is it Ronaldo? Endless debate, endless questions. I mean, we've got entire talk radio stations dedicated to talk about sports. But it's not just limited to sports, is it? This idea of who's the best, who's better than another person, who's uh, upward in the hierarchy and who's at the bottom of the heap, right? Think about life as a student. You get a test back. You get homework back in the middle of class. What is your first question? What did you get? What did you get? And what's at the heart of that question? Do you, do you care what your friend got or do you care what your friend got compared to you? Who's on top? Who's not quite on top? Where do I rank? Am I the best in the class? Am I the worst in the class? Do I need to be stronger in the next test? Do I need to be less? Whatever it is. But it doesn't stop there either, right? Test grades become class grades. Class grades become GPA. You look at SAT scores. You look at ACT scores. And suddenly it's not just about who's valedictorian of your graduating class. Suddenly it's about who's got the bigger salary. Who's got the bigger office, the better job, the larger 401k? Who's at the top and who's at the bottom? How big is your house? How big is your family? How big is your retirement? How many different ways can we measure to see who is the greatest? Because this is inherent to us as human beings. We rank ourselves. We compare ourselves to those around us. We want to do well in life. We want to succeed at those things that we have chosen to do, but so often we feel that for us to succeed, somebody else has to fail. We need to be better, at least better than the next guy. Well, so we find every measuring stick we can. We just want to see if we can measure up to our peers. We do it as kids. We do it as adults. It doesn't matter. It is ingrained in us to try to figure out who is the greatest. And if I can make a little confession to you, pastors are not immune to this. Pastors have a tendency, we, we never ask it directly, but that question of how big is your church? How many members do you have? What's the size of your budget? How much do you give to missions? There's any number of ways we can do this. And we do it all over, all through life. Who is the greatest? Where do I rank? Where do I stack up? Because the Christian faith is not an automatic cure for this disease we have, a disease of selfishness and of pride. And we even see it in the disciples, right? These men walking right next to Jesus for months and years, and yet they're asking the exact same question, who is the greatest? It's an issue for all of us. And because it's an issue for all of us, I want to look at Jesus' answer. When the disciples ask this question of him, and we're going to turn to Matthew 18 together, if you have your Bibles. Jesus looks at the disciples and he answers their question, who is the greatest? 
But obviously, because it's Jesus, he doesn't do it in the way they anticipate. Jesus doesn't rank his disciples. All right, we got Peter on top, and then James and John, you're right below him, and then we're going to move on to Thomas and Andrew, and he doesn't do that. Why would he do that? But he does answer their question. So let's look at it together. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is coming from the disciples, these friends of Jesus. Again, they're not immune to this need we have to understand our place in the world. They are asking themselves, how do I measure up? And where does this come from? As we look at the disciples in particular, they're dealing with the same human nature we all do. But Jesus has also been spending more time just with his disciples, just with the twelve and some additional followers that we know about, rather than going out and and preaching to the crowds as a whole, to the masses, the thousands of people that were following him earlier, Jesus is investing a lot more time in his close friends. And the disciples may have noticed a, a pattern emerging, a few men, a few names that are standing out among their group. Just a short time ago in our study through Matthew, we, we looked at three men, Peter, James, and John, going up a mountainside with Jesus. And there they saw Jesus transfigured into all his glory, standing there with Elijah and Moses. They got to understand more of Jesus. They got to experience more of who he was because of their presence with him. We look at Peter in particular. Peter walked on water, even if it was only for just a moment. Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus blesses him for his confession. Peter, just moments ago, caught a fish with money in its mouth so that he could pay his taxes and Jesus' taxes. And what have we heard from the rest of the disciples? What names come to mind? Peter, James, and John, they're, they're the top of the heap as far as we understand The rest of the disciples, what do we hear about them? They are men of little faith, even failed to cast out a demon. They were having a lot of success before. They were feeding the masses. They were operating with Jesus. They were doing healings alongside him. And maybe in their minds, they might think to themselves, you know what, Peter isn't all that great. Jesus blessed him, yes, but then he turned around and called him Satan. Maybe I have an in. Maybe I can get to the top of the class. We ask this question, who is the greatest? And I think it comes from an honest place in our lives, even though it's a flawed place. I think we all understand it. We all mirror it. We want to know where we belong. We want to know that we're accepted. We want to know where we stand. We don't want to know that we are loved. But so often in our lives, to know that we are accepted and welcomed and loved means that sometimes somebody's in and somebody's out. Were the disciples, were they worried about their acceptance? Were they worried about Jesus' attention to them? Was it a pride thing? I don't know. There's only 12 people in the world. And these disciples, these men gathered around Jesus, they get to be in that inner circle. And still they ask the question, where do I rank? Where do I stand? Am I accepted? Am I loved? And Jesus doesn't care about rankings. He's not out to have these men compete with each other for highest honors. He's not warning them that They might be replaced if they don't perform well. That's not what he's about. So when they ask Jesus this question, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus takes their question and he just turns it completely upside down. 
And what he says is, it's not about being great in the kingdom. What you need to worry about is being in the kingdom in the first place. Because your pride is pointing you in the wrong direction. It's not about great, it's not about lesser, it's about being part of the kingdom. And he's looking at these men and he's saying, you are so full of pride right now, you're so full of lust and desire for position and ranking. And that very attitude is leading you in the wrong direction. That's not a kingdom of heaven attitude to desire more and more. That's a pride, that's a selfishness. You need to understand, what does it take to get into the kingdom of heaven? Not what does it take to be the greatest? So he takes a child, a little boy who's among the group that's following at this time. And the word used here is a very young child, like kindergarten, first grade, six years old, seven, something like that. Calls this boy up to the front of the group. And he says to the disciples, I don't want to talk about the greatest in the kingdom. Because that's not what matters. That's not what you should be concerned about. Unless you are changed, unless you turn and humble yourselves like this little child, this little boy in front of us, you won't even make it into the kingdom at all. It's not about greatness. He wants to make sure that we are part of the kingdom, period. Get into the kingdom. Because that's obviously not a guarantee. Even, even among these close followers, right? We've got 12 men here that are all vying to be the greatest. One of them is Judas Iscariot. One of them is going to betray Jesus. These men are not guaranteed heaven. There is still heart work to be done among these men. So his concern, Jesus' concern with them is, is that they would enter the kingdom. That they would continue to pursue what the kingdom of heaven means. So we ask this question, how then do we enter the kingdom? If this is Jesus' concern in this passage, not about ranking, not about great or less, but about entering the kingdom, we ask the question then, how do we enter the kingdom? I want to point out three things that Jesus says in this passage about entering the kingdom. Three things. First, Jesus is saying, you've got to ask the right questions to begin. You have to start with the right questions. Did you know, according to a study by Ralph B. Smith, children ask about 125 questions every day? Some of you parents are going, duh. (laughs) The study didn't say it, but you have to think that especially at a certain age, those 125 questions are all the same question. Why? Right? Can I have candy for breakfast? Oh, you can't have candy for breakfast. Why? Because it's not good for you. Why? Because there's too much sugar. It's, it'll be bad for you. Why? It'll rot your teeth. Why? It goes on, right? We could do this all day, and some kids do. But as we get older, those questions go away. As we grow up, those questions seem to disappear to the point where, as adults, how many questions do you think we ask every day on average by this same study? If kids are averaging 125 questions a day, get a number in your head. Adults ask an average of six. Six questions every day. And I would suggest to you that that decrease of 119 questions every day is because as adults we have a tendency to think we already know the answers. And if we think we know the answers, then we're not going to ask the question in the first place. As adults, we know how the world works, or at least we think we do. We don't ask those exploratory questions. What holds the sky up? Why does the moon follow me when we drive in the car? We don't even bother to ask one another what your favorite dinosaur is, right? We don't ask these questions because we think we know the important answers, and we think that Asking about dinosaurs or natural phenomena is beneath us. We've grown up. We've become jaded. And so we'd stop asking questions. The disciples, they thought they knew the way the world works. Same way we treat it. That there's rankings, there's hires, there's lowers, there's ins and there's outs. 
And so their one question was, where do I rank in the midst of this? Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question to begin with. If you're worried about being the greatest, then you're actually in danger of missing the kingdom at all because the kingdom isn't about being great. Your questions need to be about what God says, how God rules, and he's saying to the disciples and now to us, stop assuming that you know the score. Ask the right questions, first and foremost. And the right question is, as Jesus says, how do I enter the kingdom? We ask the right questions. And the first answer he gives is, like a child. So this is our our second thing. How do I enter the kingdom of God? I enter humbly, like a child. This is the example that that Jesus gives. He says, verse 2, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Instead, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's a movie a number of years back, a movie called Finding Neverland. And it was about James Barry, who was an author. He wrote Peter Pan. And uh, specifically, the, the play of Peter Pan was written in 1904. And some of you may have seen it. It's still very popular today. But the culture of the theater in Barry's day was very much dominated by uh, tuxedo-wearing patrons, well-dressed, who expected dignified and important productions, things that would teach us about the world, things that they could then talk about at the office the next day. It was very much a place to be seen. Barry wanted to go in the opposite direction. He didn't want important plays about worldly matters. He wanted to re-inject wonder and awe and humor and laughter into his plays. But he realized that this was a dramatic shift from where the crowds normally expected their plays to go. So when the opening night for his play, Peter Pan, came, he began to worry. He worried about how this fantastical, whimsical, and wonderful play would go over with this stodgy, sophisticated crowd. And so, to the chagrin of the theater owner, Charles, Barry reserves 25 seats sprinkled throughout the auditorium for surprise guests, mystery guests, and he won't tell Charles who they are. And these seats are still empty, even as the last call is being Uh, called out. Everyone needs to take their seats. These 25 seats remain empty until the camera jets to the outside where a group of nuns are bringing some orphans, 25 kids, to see this play. And Barry turns to Charles and he says, they're here. Do forgive them for being late. Short legs and a long walk from the orphanage will do that. And Charles responds, I'm not sure what they're doing here. I don't understand this. Well, they've come to see the play. And Charles says, well, now my nightmare is complete. And as the orphans take their seats, again, scattered amongst the crowd, the disapproving patrons start to look at these little kids next to them. This is not the crowd they expected. These are not the neighbors sitting next to them that they wanted there. But as the curtain rises and as the play begins, we see these kids not worried about how they're dressed, not worried about what they're going to say to their friends and neighbors at the office the next morning. They are entranced and intrigued by this play on the stage. And then as the adults look again at the stage, they start to see through the eyes of the kids. As the kids smile and chuckle and laugh, If you're familiar with the play, you've got Nana the dog coming out on stage, but it's a person dressed up in a dog costume. How ridiculous. If you're expecting sophisticated material, how ridiculous to have somebody in a dog costume. But the kids in the crowd, they laugh, they smile, and they get caught up in the wonder of the play. So instead of starting to sneer and raise an eyebrow at these things that happen, Peter Pan chasing his shadow all over, then trying to stick it back on with soap, The the girl, Wendy, giving Peter a a thimble for a kiss. We've got fairies, we've got pirates and mermaids and lost boys. All of a sudden, these older, stodgy, sophisticated patrons are laughing uproariously alongside the kids right next to them. 
And when the opening act closes, the audience is roaring with applause. And now convinced, the theater manager, Charles, he looks in from the side curtain and he just whispers, genius. Getting these adults, getting these old patrons to see with the eyes of a child made it all the difference. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing with, with his example here. Look at this child amongst us. Look at their humility. Look at their exuberance. Look at their dependence on somebody else for their well-being. This is how we come into the kingdom of heaven. We come humbly like a child. The, the children in this play, they didn't come expecting that they would know everything or expecting to understand the smatterings of philosophy or worldviews. They didn't come to be seen. They came to enjoy. They came to have their eyes open. They came humbly, waiting to discover, and they were delighted at what they found. God's way is never the same as our way. I think that's a consistent message throughout Scripture. God's way is never the same as our way, what we expect it to be. The way the world ranks its people, the way the world deems greatness or power or wealth, that's not how God operates. His very first public lessons begins with these words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And it goes on from there. None of these, none of these people would be deemed blessed or happy or great according to world views that, that are, exist around us. Not a single person who looks at the world and, and sees power and wealth and authority and fame and all these things, nobody's going to look and say, that person is poor in spirit. Blessed are they. No, blessed are the, the rich, blessed are the powerful, happy are the satisfied, the, the meek, the mourning, the hungry. These are not people that are seen well by the world. None of them are strong, none of them are powerful, but that's exactly why God has flipped the script. That's not what God is looking for. God wants the humble. He wants those who are going to come like children. Open hearts, open minds, ready to learn, ready to follow. Doesn't matter if we don't know much. Doesn't matter if we admit to ourselves, you know what, I need to be taught all of this because it seems brand new to me. That's exactly the heart that God is looking for. God wants the children who are going to depend completely on their good father. We know he's good. We know he's a provider. And therefore we can follow. Therefore we can give ourselves to him. Therefore, we can trust like children. And the more we fill our minds with how we think things should be, the less room we seem to have for what God is actually saying to us. And what God is saying to us, his first word here, is turn. Unless you turn and become like children. Verse 3. And this mirrors, of course, Jesus' first instruction. As he came upon the scene, Matthew records for us that Jesus went about the nations, went about the, the area surrounding this nation of Israel. And his message was, repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn around from the direction you're going, because you are not aiming at heaven. Give up your way, because it's the wrong way. Put that old self to death. Be born again. Become like a child again. Give up that old selfish way, that old prideful way, that old sinful way that you're used to. This is Jesus' message. So we start by asking the right questions. What is God looking for? We start by coming humbly to the idea of the kingdom. And third, we need to take sin seriously. Because God certainly does. Sin is, in fact, what defines that old self, that old way. Everything that we are 
tossing aside as we become like a child, as we become born again, as we become humble. What we're getting rid of is sin. Sin is actually what keeps us from God, and therefore he takes it exceptionally seriously. Look with me at verses 5-9 through nine here. Jesus continues, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. I dare say Jesus is taking sin very seriously here. Those are graphic images. Those are graphic pictures that he is putting into our mind. And as, as we're talking about sin, as we're talking about taking sin seriously, we see it in two facets, two parts. First, we have others in mind. We are others-minded. And then we are self-minded. And even that flips the script, right? Right? Get ourselves out of first place. We are thinking of others first. So first, these others. Jesus shifts here from the literal child that he has standing in front of them to basically new believers. Those who have come to the kingdom humbly, like a child. Humbled themselves. They've opened up to childlike humility and wonder and dependence, and now they are believing. This is who Jesus is referring to. And he says, whoever receives one such child, one such believer in my name, also receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones, these new believers, whoever causes them to sin, woe to you, Jesus says. If you, in your, in your pride, in your worldly mindedness, if you come to this new believer and you laugh at their faith, you laugh at their naivete, How could you believe such a a simple word? If you tell him that, you know, that's all well and good, but that's pretty naive. There's other things you should do. There's other things you should look at. Jesus says it would be better for you to be drowned in the sea than to suggest such a thing to a new believer, to, to drag them away from this gospel they have believed in. If you're teaching a false gospel, If you're suggesting that a new believer needs anything other than Jesus, you would be better off dead. Again, this is very strong language. But Jesus is is believing it, intending it with all his heart. You better believe that Jesus cares for his children. These new believers. These believers that we, we light a candle for in celebration on a Sunday morning. Jesus cares for each and every one of them just like any good father, like any good mother, because he knows how vulnerable we can be in this moment where we have gotten rid of those things that we held on to so tightly, all these sinful attitudes and actions, these things that made us great in our own eyes, we've gotten rid of those. We've moved into faith. We've decided that no, Jesus is enough. And that is a moment of vulnerability for us. And if somebody says, how stupid is that? What kind, of, what kind of new faith is going to crumble? There, there are certainly going to be attacks on somebody who has made a decision. And that's the reason why when we, when we do light a candle on a Sunday morning, we pray for that person. We ask God, God to guard them and protect them in this new decision because there will be temptations. Jesus even says that here. There are temptations in the world. Temptations to run back to what's familiar and those things that felt safe, even if it's not what God wants for us. But then he goes on and he says, there is a special curse. There is a special woe given to those who would drag a new believer away from that gospel message. Who would drag them away and offer them something else. Woe to the one by whom temptation comes. How dare you attack these little believers? 
as a dad, right, if you, if you attack me with your words or with your actions, I can take it. I'm going to shrug it off. I can deal with that. That's, that's between you and me. We can do that. You attack my kids, we're done. Right? Friendships, over. I will go to any length necessary to protect my kids, and I think every parent would say the same. Parents love their kids, protect their kids, stand up and defend their kids. And Jesus is saying the same thing here. You go after my little ones, my new believers, those having a childlike faith in me, you go after them. Be better off dead. So we need to watch out for the hearts of other people. We need to learn how to serve them well, guard them well, love them well. And then finally he says, you are others-minded as we look at sin. Now also watch out in your own life because Christians are not immune to temptation. And I think we all know this if we're honest. Jesus uses this graphic imagery. He says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, just cut it off. Throw it away because it's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands, two feet, and be thrown into hell. Or if your eye causes you to sin, he says, tear it out, throw it away, because being in heaven with one eye is better than being in hell with two. He's drawing us back to the stark distinction between life and death. And it's our choices, it's our sin that defines that. We need to take sin seriously. Part of that is we don't dabble in it. We don't open yourself up to temptation. And that sounds like common sense. But I feel like we do it constantly. We start to say to ourselves, I can handle that. I can tolerate that. I, can, I, can, I know I struggled with that before, but maybe just a little bit. That's not going to suck me back in. Maybe just a little There's a TV show called Temptation Island, probably the worst show I've ever heard of. This one is described as committed couples who put their love to the test. So they go as as couples, but then they split up and they stay with people of the opposite gender and subject themselves to temptation place themselves in harm's way on purpose to test their love. How I'm going to say things I regret. How stupid. How idiotic. And how common. I mean, just in this case, right? Why would you try to prove the strength of your love by dabbling in temptation with somebody else? Why would you risk it? You run away from temptation. If you love somebody, you hang on to them. You don't pretend like you're going to get rid of them. I don't know. Maybe you see that and say, well, that's, that's reality TV. That's not me. That's not, that's not my heart or my intention. Well, there's other, there's other issues out there. You have a gambling issue, and yet you drive past the casino just to see who's there, see if you recognize some cars. Maybe you go in just to see who's playing on the stage tonight. Just one step after another. I can handle this much. I can handle that much. People coming out of alcoholism with drinking problems. Do you go to the bar just to hang out with your friends? Is that what you tell yourself? Does any of us struggle with pornography? This is something that runs rampant in the church. And we're not immune in our church either. But if you struggle with that, what are you doing about it? What, what guards and, and fences have you put into place? Do you have accountability partners? Do you have programs or, or things that... Uh, I, know, I know there's some that will email accountability partners and give them a list of the sites you visited. Is that something that you're doing if you struggle with this? I had a friend in seminary who actually ripped the modem out of his computer because it was that much of an issue for him. He came knocking on my door one afternoon, handed me this, this card, this piece of electronics. He said, Scott, I can't have it in my computer anymore. I need you to hang on to it for me. And I did. And he never asked for it back. And we, we built that friendship. We built that accountability because he was willing to 
figuratively cut off his hand. Maybe you need to do something like that. Well, Scott, how can I, how can I live without the internet? That's just not even possible today. What does Jesus say? If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And if I can paraphrase, it would be better to enter heaven without internet access than to be thrown in eternal fire. We really do tend not to take sin very seriously. And when we, when we operate in that, we deny the gospel by the way we behave. But Jesus is warning here, strongest possible language. Basically saying, there's no half measures here. If your hand causes you to sin, well, just take the pinky and we'll start there. No, he says, get rid of it. If there is sin in your life, cut it out, throw it away, get rid of it completely. Put it to death. There's no half measures. There's no almost heaven. I've, I've heard the question, is, is Jesus being literal here? And, and the answer, I think, of course, is no. This is a picture of how serious this is. And yet, if I could distill sin down to one hand in my life, wouldn't it be worth it to cut it off? If I could distill everything sinful and human about me, everything earthly about me, and distill it down to one part of my body, wouldn't it be better to cut that off? I mean, this is a graphic example. Jesus is is not strictly being literal here, no. But that's the length to which we need to go to take sin seriously, to cut it out of our lives. Instead, focusing only on our humility, our childlike dependence on God for those things that he sees as good and right and necessary. We talk about sacrifice, cutting off a hand or losing an eye. What did God do to get rid of sin? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to die for us so that whoever believes in him shall not perish like we deserve, but instead have eternal life. That's the length to which God went to deal with sin in my life, in your life, in all of our lives. God sacrificed his son for you and me. That's the lengths to which we go. The kingdom is worth it. The kingdom is worth everything that we could give in order to obtain it. We look at the other parables of Jesus. This is a treasure. This is a pearl. This is something to be pursued and desired above all other things, is to be in the presence of God himself. And if it means losing what we see as valuable today, it's worth it. It's good and right. But the good news of it, the best news, is that Jesus has already done that hard work for us. Jesus is the one who is recreating us. Jesus is the one who is calling us to himself. Jesus is the one who is doing the heart work inside us to make us more and more like him. And our job, as he says, come like a child. Don't come hanging on to those things that we hold so dear. Don't come hanging on to our sin and our old ways of doing things. Don't come holding on so tightly, but rather just humbly to receive, to learn, to understand from God himself. This is what he desires. This is what he wants for us, to ask the right questions. What does God want? To come humbly and to take sin seriously. This is something we need to do. I'm going to pray in just a moment and then we'll come to the communion table together to remember that sacrifice Jesus made to bring us to himself. Would you bow your heads with me as we close? Lord Jesus Christ, this graphic and and harsh language I hope opens our eyes. I think that's your purpose here. To see the seriousness of sin. 
And Lord, what a lie of the enemy that it's just not that big a deal. That we can handle it in our own strength. What a lie that we live out day in and day out. God, give us the strength to give up. Sometimes the hardest step to take is to surrender. But that is exactly what we need. That is exactly what you are calling us to is humility and surrender. So together, Lord, we ask your forgiveness for where we have missed the mark that you have set. Together we ask for the strength to be the people you have called us to be, to be your children. And so as we come to the communion table, Lord, we ask that you would once again speak, remind us through these remembrances of your sacrifice. God, call us again and help us to come like your children. We pray it in your name. Amen. We do turn at this time to our communion table. We turn to this moment of saying to Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice that he has made. When it comes to sin in our lives,